Hebrews 10 and verses 11 through 14 and verses 19 through 25. Let's, um, let's read through the text and see what we're going to be talking about today. Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 14. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when this priest has entered uh, for all times one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. But by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And then verse, verse 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance of that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the practice or the habit of doing. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Father, thank you so very much for your word. Thank you very much for the inspiration that we have had so far today, and we just ask your blessings upon this message that it will touch our hearts, Father, and we will know uh, just how significant our high priest is and how he is working on our behalf every day. Thank you so very much. We come and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as we look at this, at this passage, we are talking here about the change in the priesthood. A change from the Levitical priesthood to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. A change from the priesthood of the Old Covenant to a priesthood of the New Covenant under which we are today. Now under the Old Covenant that's what it starts out here with in verse 11. The Old Covenant says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duty again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Day after day, the people of Israel would sin and they would go to the priest at the temple and they would repent of their sins. And the priest would offer sacrifices to God for the sins of the people. It was an animal sacrifice. He would shed their blood. The priest would teach the people. They would judge the people. And the priest would uh, also make that atonement for the people as they came and as they repented. He was a go-between before the people and God. And the priest would do this day in and day out. The people sinned and they wanted forgiveness as God required. And the blood of the animal would be atoned for the sins of the people. The Levitical priests never finish their work. Symbolically, the tabernacle had no seats. The priests there would always stand. They stood and offered the same sacrifices daily. There was, uh, however, one basic problem with this system. 
He could never fix the basic problem of removing sin. It could never fix the problem of removing sin. It could never take away sin. Christ is our new covenant high priest, sacrificed once, and once on the cross, shedding his blood as an atonement for each and every sin that we commit. One, one sacrifice. It was an atonement for all of our sins. As a result, the work of offering continual sacrifices through the shedding of blood of our sins was complete. Once and for all, Jesus' work was finished. So he sat down. Can you get the significance of that? The animal sacrifices that was killed and their blood was spread was an atonement for that, for that sin of the people uh, in the ancient times. But Jesus' sacrifice was, he was sacrificed, he lost blood on our behalf, and it was a continuous atonement. He sat down, he didn't have to stand. He didn't have to stand over and over, day and day in and day out. So he sat down at the right hand of the Father because that work was, was finished. What does it say in verse 12 here? Verse 12 says, But when this priest, that's Jesus, but when this priest had offered for all times one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus' sacrifice effectively cleansed us from all our sins. And yes, for those sins that we would commit in the future. Yes. <coughs> Jesus' death was sufficient to forgive all our sins. I'm going to ask, uh, we can play a video now. We have a short video that I want you to, to listen to. What was the significance of the temple veil being torn in two when Jesus died? During the lifetime of Jesus, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem was the center of Jewish religious life. The temple was the place where animal sacrifices were carried out, and worship, according to the law of Moses, was followed faithfully. Hebrews 9, 1-9 tells us that in the temple, a veil separated the Holy of Holies, the earthly dwelling place of God's presence, from the rest of the temple where men dwelt. This signified that man was separated from God by sin. Only the high priest was permitted to pass beyond this veil once each year to enter into God's presence for all of Israel and make atonement for their sins. Solomon's temple was 30 cubits high, but Herod had increased the height to 40 cubits, according to the writings of Josephus, a first century Jewish historian. There is uncertainty as to the exact measurement of a cubit, but it is safe to assume that the veil was somewhere near 60 feet high. In early Jewish tradition, says that the veil was about four inches thick. But the Bible does not confirm that measurement. The book of Exodus teaches that the thick veil was fashioned from glue, purple, and scarlet material in fine twisted linen. The size and the thickness of the veil make the events occurring at the moment of Jesus' death on the cross so much more momentous. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So, what do we make of this? What significance does this torn veil have for us today? Above all, the tearing of the veil at the moment of Jesus' death dramatically symbolized that his sacrifice, the shedding of his own blood, was a sufficient atonement for sins. It signified that now the only way into the Holy of Holies was open for all people, for all time, both Jew and Gentile. When Jesus died, the veil was torn and God moved out of that place never again to dwell in a temple made with hands.
God was through with that temple and its religious system. And the temple and Jerusalem were left desolate, destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 70, just as Jesus prophesied in Luke 13.35. As long as the temple stood, it signified the continuation of the Old Covenant. Hebrews 9, 8-9 refers to the age that was passing away as the New Covenant was being established. In a sense, the veil was symbolic of Christ himself as the only way to the Father. This is indicated by the fact that the high priest had to enter the Holy of Holies through the veil. Now, Christ is our superior high priest, and as believers in his finished work, we partake of his better priesthood. We can now enter the Holy of Holies through him. Hebrews 10, 19-20 says that the faithful enter into the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. Here we see the image of Jesus' flesh being torn for us, just as he was tearing the veil for us. The veil being torn from top to bottom is a fact of history. The profound significance of this event is explained in glorious detail in Hebrews. The things of the temple were shadows of things to come, and they all ultimately point us to Jesus Christ. He was the veil to the Holy of Holies, and through his death, the faithful now have free access to God. The veil in the temple was a constant reminder that sin renders humanity unfit for the presence of God. The fact that the sin offering was offered annually and countless other sacrifices repeated daily showed graphically that sin could not be truly atoned for or erased by mere animal sacrifices. Jesus Christ, through his death, has removed the barriers between God and man, and now we may approach him with confidence and boldness. Got questions? The Bible has answers, and we'll help you find them. The last part was a little announcement, was a little advertisement. I think you got the, got the picture. So we see that as supreme creator of everything, Jesus' life, his death, was worth the sum total of everything that he created. And when he created, when he died, his spilled blood could atone for all of our sins. And yes, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, a sign of victory. His work had been completed. It's a position of victory, a position of glory and honor at the right hand of the Father. Verse 13 of our text. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. So he's at the right hand of his Father, and he's waiting. Now I want you to remember something. Uh, in this context, um, John, if you would turn to John 14th chapter, John 14, verses 2 to 4. John 14, 2 to 4. For my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I, have not, would I have told you that I am going uh, there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to uh, be with me, that you will be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So Jesus said that he was going to prepare a place for us. There's plenty of room there, many rooms. In that mansion and that was one thing he is now doing while he's at the father's right hand revelation 19 revelation 19 verse 7 let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. 
The bride wasn't ready. The bride is in the process of making herself ready. And then in Revelation 21, <coughs> verses 2 through 4. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away tears from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order has passed away. So we have a new order. We have a new high priest. It's been, it has been passed away. So Jesus is in the process now of preparing for us. That's what he's doing as our high priest sitting at the right hand of the Father. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. Verse 25. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now, who are the enemies? Who is, will be made the footstool of Jesus? Well, we're in Corinthians 15, we're at verse 25. Let's look at verse 54 of Hebrews 15. Verse 54 says, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. So one of the things that he's going to put under his feet is death. That death is an enemy. Death saddens everyone. Takes our loved ones away. 2 Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds <coughs> of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. There is a God of this world. He's going to be put under his feet. Jesus is waiting for that. He's at the right hand of the Father, ready, waiting for death to be put away, waiting for Satan to be put away. <laughs> Here's a special notice here that I, I was able to write down. The resurrected Christ will conquer all evil, including death. Christ's work is to defeat evil on the, all evil on the earth. First, he defeated sin and death on the cross. And in the final days, he will defeat Satan and all evil. World events may seem out of control, and justice may seem scarce, but God is in control. Always allowing rather evil to remain for a time until the Father sends Jesus to earth again. Then Christ will present to God a perfect new world. We're just waiting. We're just waiting. Jesus is patient. And he's helping us to be developed into the people that we need to be. A new and living way. We heard that mentioned in that video. A new and living way, and we're going to talk about that in verse 20 in a little bit, open for us through the curtain. Let's read uh, verse 14 of our text. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect. By his one sacrifice, 
He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. He has made perfect those who are being made holy. You know, as um, Jesus is there at God's right hand, he serves as our advocate. He's there advocating on our behalf. Arlene is not here, but a couple of years ago, she wrote a paper. She writes a lot of papers. And she wrote a paper about Jesus Christ being our uh, our lawyer and how uh, Satan is always accusing us and coming before God with stuff against us like uh, he did to Job. And Jesus is right there. He's our lawyer. He's our attorney. He's defending us. He's working in our behalf because he's right there in a position of power and honor and glory on our behalf. Uh, you know, kind of as a as a side note, um, I feel that God <coughs> orchestrated services last week. I couldn't be here because of Pink Eye, and Melissa and John conducted the Bible study. What's so amazing about grace? And all of you had a chance to participate in it because they were the ministers. And they conducted that. And all of you people were part of that Bible study. All of you dealt with the difficult subjects regarding the things that uh, Philip Yancey brought out about the, uh, the LGBTQ community. And, and I, don't, I wasn't here. What were some of the other groups that Philip Yancey talked about? Uh, divorcees. And uh, all, all these problems in our society that we, as Christians, <coughs> need to show grace toward. I wasn't here, but I'm kind of familiar with what his approach to things. And those are things that, that we, as Christ's, Christ's community, we need to know and understand about. These, are, these things are real enigmas for, the, enigmas for the Christian community. And I think those are all of the subjects that are needed, that we need to, to, be, we needed to be confronted with. And I think Philip Yancey did a, an excellent job in presenting the subjects to you all in the form of a Bible study, and you all had an opportunity to give your input about what you thought about those subjects. You know, when it comes to the lesbians and the gays, uh, that's hard for Christians to deal with. And that's what verse 14 is talking about. We are being made holy. And we are in a position where we need to know how to deal with those things. Uh, what did I have here on my notes? Anyway, I don't see it right here. But uh, we are moving to a new community. And these situations will, I'm sure, rear their heads. How are we going to deal with them? We come to an understanding by talking about these things and sharing them together. Christ is making us perfect as a holy people unto himself. And he is there waiting for us to grow and for us to learn and so that we can demonstrate those things in our lives. He is our great high priest. He's making available everything we need to prepare us to meet the Father. Sounds like a plan to me. I mean, he doesn't do anything half-hearted. And he comes at the right time when the Father has things ready. Not before then. He's working on that. Jesus is our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our King. 
Mr. Perry, ready for that second video.
at the right hand of the Father working in our behalf. Amen. What's the title of my sermon? The Significance of Our High Priest. Does all of that give you confidence in Jesus? That's who he is. Do you know him? As a man answered the question. Verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, and I want to stop right there, because he goes on, he gives us about three things that we are to be doing. I want to stop right there and want to look back over these verses, 19 through 20. As a result of all of this, brother, of who Jesus is, as a result of the new and living way of approaching God, not the old system of offering animal sacrifices by the priest at the altar, this new and living way where Jesus died and shed his blood as our sacrificial lamb, and his body was broken open, and the curtain torn from top to bottom. As a result of this, we can come boldly and confidently into the most holy place, the very presence of God. In prayer for forgiveness when we sin because that curtain or that veil has been torn from top to bottom. When Christ's body was broken. Verse 20 says again, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. Hebrews 3 verse 6 but Christ is faithful as the Son of God. It, but Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house. This new high priest is, is over God's house. That's us. And then verse 22 says, Since we have all of this, verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near to Christ. We can do that now. We can go straight to the Father. We don't need the middle man. We don't need to go to the priest and confess to him what we've done. And then he goes slip the throat of an animal and shed his blood so that we can be so that we can be forgiven. We can go straight. The, the curtain was torn. We have exact, we have uh, direct access to God. So let us go straight to God in prayer. Jesus is our advocate, as I mentioned before. We don't have that middle man. And we have no guilt because we've been cleansed. We've been washed with the water through baptism. Our sins were forgiven. Sin keeps you from God. 
when all of our sins and I have been forgiven. Verse 20, 23. Let us hope unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us hold steadfastly to the hope we profess. What hope? That Jesus will one day return to set up his kingdom on this earth. And we will be a part of that. That's what he's waiting for. To put his, his enemies under him, to become his, his footstool, and to deliver us. Because he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to make you ready. I'm going to make my bride ready. Verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another. And all the more as we see the day approaching. And brother, now, these verses 24 and 25 are written in the original Greek in somewhat of a progressive form, a very active form. We are to value our time together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Not forsaking ourselves from one another as the practice of some is. Some commentaries, as I mentioned, this is written in a very progressive form, a very active form. And some commentaries put it this, this way. Um, Consider one another, well, let me go back up right here. Um, <coughs> some, common, some commentaries uh, actually translate these terms, this term, spur one another, as meaning to irritate or to aspirate one another to good works. Uh, and they, they go on to say, Christians are to exhort by the, uh, are exhorted by the verb provoke or spur to be constantly aware of one another and the need to stimulate one another. Uh, it refers to a sharp contention and argument suggesting that believers must sharply confront one another uh, with their responsibilities. If such admonition is to take place, Christians must meet together on a regular basis. And they're saying that, uh, you know, we need to be in each other's faces uh, as Christians. Well, you know, I don't quite agree with that, but I think that the emphasis should be on encouraging one another, not an in-your-face type of a confrontation, an argumentative thing, and arguing over religion, and you need to be doing this, and you need to be doing that. I don't think that's quite what that's talking about. It says, consider one another as you can spur one another on to love and good deeds. Provoke one another to love and uh, to love and good deeds. Let us take one another into thoughts with the aim of stimulating mutual love and deeds. So it, it really means we need to be gathering ourselves together so that we can keep each other on the straight and the narrow as far as that encouragement. We need to not separate ourselves as some, some is. Um, you have to forgive me. This is two weeks of notes I missed, I missed last week, so I tried to add some more, and I'm kind of lost, lost in my, my notes right here. But uh, an excellent example, I think, of what this verse is talking about is, 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 is with the Acts 2 church. Remember Acts 2 and the church in Acts 2? Let's just take a, a quick look there. I hope I don't run too much over time. 
But let's just take a look at how the church of the Acts 2 church was. Back in Acts 2, starting in like about verse 29. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here uh, to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God has uh, promised him an oath that he would uh, place one on his, of his descendants on the throne. Seeing uh, what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah and that he was not abandoned uh, to the realm of the dead. Am I reading the right thing? Okay. Uh, continuing. Uh, verse 31, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it, exalt, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Wherefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made uh, his, this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and uh, Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, and this is verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he placed with them, uh, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. So they had fellowship together, this Acts 2 church, this new church. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the, by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold uh, property and possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying uh, the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, uh, such as should be, should be saved. Now, they were in a community. They all lived together. The church was together. They could walk to each other's homes. We live in a different society now. We live miles apart. But that grew that church together, and that Church, that group began to multiply. We can do things together. And I listed down here a number of things that we can really do. We can forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. I mean, we have people here who come from Tipton. That's over an hour's drive away to get here for service. That's tremendous. But we need to be here together. Having others over now, I know some people say, well, you know, my house is not that great. I'm a fun bachelor. You know, I don't know how to keep a clean house. But you can do other things. You might not have people at your house, but have activities together. Visiting our sick, telephone calls, spending time together, doing things together, encouraging one another. You can encourage one another with a telephone. Thinking about one another. It was mentioned here in the word. Thinking about one another. Praying for one another. 
not forsaking ourselves together, provoking each other to good works. And verse 25 of our text says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the practice of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As we know, the time is getting short. We few should be together. Now, when I say we few, I'm talking about our congregation, but all the congregations around the world. And um, I just can't get over that one verse that Jesus uh, prayed when he was in the wilderness. He says, Father, I pray not for the world, but I pray for these that you have given me. There's a time to pray for the world, and there's a time that we need to be looking out for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, I've kind of jumped and jumped through my notes. Uh, and they're here and there, and they're everywhere. I think I've, I've covered everything. We are to value our time together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Not that the safety of ourselves together as a practice of some is. Three things that uh, he told us <laughs> as a result of this new order, this new high priest that we have. We are to draw near to God in prayer and stay close to him. We are to hold steadfastly to that hope that he's coming back. And his reward is with him. And we are to spur one another on to good works and good deeds. That's the significance of our high priest and what he's done for us. I don't think we could say it any more eloquent than the man on that video. That's my king. That's who he is to us. Thank you, Father, for uh, this day, this day of worship and praise to you. Thank you for Jesus and that he is there every day working for us tirelessly, endlessly until Father, you send him back and he has made the bride ready. Thank you. Help us to think about these things and implement them in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.